The Birth Circle podcast features experts in all the nuanced areas of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum with the aim of helping women make the choices that will keep them safe, healthy, and empowered. We respect all birth choices and believe in supporting informed consent and evidence-based practices. Nothing said on this podcast should be taken as medical advice. You should always seek the advice of a competent professional for your care. Welcome to the Birth Circle podcast. This is Sarah with Birth Circle, and today I have Bailey Gaddis, and Bailey is the author of Feng Shui Mommy, Creating Balance and Harmony for Blissful Pregnancy, Childbirth, and Motherhood, and Asking for a Pregnant Friend, 101 Answers to Questions that Women Are Too Ashamed or Scared to Ask About in Pregnancy, Birth, and Early Motherhood. That's coming soon, right, Bailey? Yeah, June June 1st, 2021. I can't wait. That's going to be great (laughs) because even though you read all the things, there's still stuff that you don't ask. Yeah, And I've had people just send me a text like, I'm so sorry. This is such a dumb question, but... It's like, not dumb. <laughs> I know. I know. And that's why I created the book. I got tons of those texts and questions and classes. So yeah. Yeah. Been- yep. So, and then we can laugh about them when you, you know, when they're on paper and how ridiculous, because some of them, they do sound really, really ridiculous, but you've never thought to ask these things because right. body, you've never been in a pregnant body before. <laughs> exactly. I know. It's a whole new ball game. Yeah, and definitely. <laughs> so... How did you um, how did you get into this whole field? Well, you know, it was kind of random, but at the same time, I guess I've been on this path my whole life. Uh, my mom is a fertility nurse, and she has been for about thirty years. So my first job in high school was working in a fertility clinic, and I never thought that I wanted to do anything with pregnancy or, or anything like that. But um, when a few years before I was pregnant with my son, who's seven now, my mother became certified as a hypnobirthing practitioner, and I became interested in that. I did some of the meditations and thought, you know, it was a great way to move past fears in general. And then when I became pregnant with my son, that's the the philosophy that, you know, I followed. And honestly, I, did, I didn't really think it would work. And then I moved into birth with my son, and I was shocked that you know, this, the deep breathing and the meditation and, you know, all the work that I had put into it actually worked. And I had, you know, an unmedicated birth, which is what, you know, I was personally hoping for. And it was life changing. I mean, of course, having a child changes your life. But beyond that, I was so impressed and forever changed by the journey that I had with, with hypnobirthing specifically. And then of course the journey through childbirth and how powerful that was. So I became really interested in childbirth preparation. When my son was six months old, I schlepped he and my husband down to San Diego and spent a week uh, getting certified, started teaching a month later and completely loved it. And about a year after that, I started having more clients asking if I could attend their births. Um, so I became certified as a, a doula and that really, you know, deepened my understanding for how different every every birth experience is and it just snowballed from there and I'm just, you know, so passionate about about this field and and working with women, you know. It's, yeah. So it never great. gets old. It never it gets old to me. I, no. People are like, oh, does it make you baby hungry? No, it's not about that. <laughs> exactly. It's not about the baby. They're nice side bonus, but it's really about the connections with women and seeing them thrive and and grow and heal and all sorts of absolutely stuff. Absolutely. So your book is um, uses the word feng shui. So. Uh, how do you apply the word feng shui to mommy? I, th- I thought that was a term that you use for like where you put your mirror in your house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, before I had my son, I owned a home organizing business in Los Angeles and we used a lot of, you know, feng shui principles. And of course we use that in the more traditional sense, you know, right. of harmonizing the energy in our home, knowing that it impacts, you know, the energy within us and and how we feel in our home. So when I first started working on the book, I was thinking, you know, of course I have two chapters that are 
specifically related to what feng shui actually is and creating that positive energy in your home. But I kind of shifted the, the term to look at how we can harmonize the energy in our mind and our body and our spirit. So that's how I, you know, organize the book. And so again, I kind of put it my own spin on the the term, but you know, I really really resonated with that idea. You know, what would it look like to to have that energy within us harmonized and how would that change our journey through pregnancy, birth and into early motherhood. So I didn't really use the literal definition, but it that's yeah, okay. It really I, I the use book. the word gourmet the same way: a gourmet <laughs> car, a gourmet house, a gourmet. Yeah, yeah, same uh-huh. thing. yeah. So, so what are the components then of a feng shui um, pregnancy? Yeah, well, you know, one of the first things is really understanding what the voice of your intuition sounds like, because especially in our culture, we're so impacted by, you know, the voice of media, number one, you know, really from birth, we're met with all these images of what, what birth looks like, you know, on TV shows and movies, and it's so traumatic. And, that implants a lot of ideas into our mind. And then of course we're influenced by, you know, our mother, our friends. And so there's a lot of voices that impact our decisions through the journey. And so I'm really big on helping women discover like, well, what, what does your voice sound like? What, what do you intuitively feel is, is the best choice for you. Um, and you know, I do a simple exercise with women in my class and we start by asking questions like, well, what do I want for dinner? And listening to that first voice that pops up. So starting with, you know, small questions and then allowing yourself to trust that first voice that comes up. Cause usually that first voice that gives us an answer is coming from our intuition. And then after that, then we start to get all the influences of, well, my mother would probably think I should do this. And that mm-hmm. one doctor I talked to. So really focusing on your intuition. And then in addition to that, realizing that every journey is different. So, you know, what your mother experienced or what your sister experienced or, you know, your best friend who you really admire, your journey will probably be different from theirs. And that is okay. And something else that I think can kind of mess with women during the experience is saying like, okay, I, you know, I resonate with unmedicated birth and I have to have that unmedicated birth. And I have a lot of women in my class that uh, are second time moms and they kind of like, oh, I was so disappointed by my birth experience because I set up these like really specific expectations based on, you know, again, other women that I know and they have this beautiful unmedicated birth and that's what I wanted. And I didn't have that. And now I feel disappointed, not only in the birth experience, but in myself. So Of course, it's important for women to discover like, well, yeah, ideally, what kind of birth would I want to have, but then kind of letting it go and trusting that you will have the journey that you are are meant to have. Yeah. And, um, and then of course, putting in the preparation because, you know, with our intuition, with, you know, navigating that journey, it's helpful to take childbirth preparation classes, to read the books. So you can find those little nuggets of wisdom that resonate with you and that guide your unique journey. Yeah. So why do we have such a hard time um, with our intuition? Why do we question our intuition so much? Something for me personally is I know that I have that that desire to fit in and to feel like I'm part of a community and that I'm liked. And I feel like at least before I really started to get strong with listening to my intuition, that made me want to, to follow what everybody else was doing and to agree with the opinions of, of people that I admired. Um, and not that they had bad opinions, but they just, a lot of those just didn't resonate with who I, I really was. And so yeah, I think that like very normal human desire of, of wanting to fit in can sometimes pull us away from what truly feels right for our own unique experience. I really, I really like that explanation because it's not something <laughs> dark or sinister. It's just merely wanting to fit in and be part of a community. Right. And if your community is telling you one thing, then it's hard to go against that. Just yeah, 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 exactly. 
So um, your book includes four sections, four trimesters, but there are only three trimesters in pregnancy, obviously. So where's that fourth, where's that fourth yeah. trimester? Yeah, so the term fourth trimester is a term used for the first three months after the baby is born. And the idea is that, you know, babies are really born before they're ready to be out into the world. You know, really they need three more months in the womb, but of course, if we gave them three more months, they would not be able to fit out of the mother's body. It just wouldn't work from a technical standpoint. So <laughs> they need to be born at that, uh, around that nine month mark. But during those first three months, they're still so incredibly dependent on, on the parents and need so much nourishment. I mean, of course, past the three month mark, but especially those, those first three months, they're so tender and need so much care. And the mother needs so much care as well, because when you think about it during pregnancy, all the mother needs to do is really take care of herself and make sure she's healthy and and eat most times. Well. Yeah, yeah, eat yeah, and exactly. sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, eat and sleep. And and the baby's usually healthy if you do that. But then during that fourth trimester, you're still needing to take care of yourself and give yourself that same level of nourishment. But now you also have this baby who requires that nourishment as well. And so that's it can when be... you really appreciate the placenta. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. The, the so you organ. become the placenta. The fourth yeah. trimester is you. Oh my gosh, I love that. That's, <laughs> that's such a good way to put it. Yeah, so you know, it's like the mother and the baby, you're going through all these huge transitions. And and for me, you know, looking back at my experience, that's actually when I needed the most support and had the most questions about like, how do I breastfeed? That's true. And, you do you know? think the questions in pregnancy are a lot? Wait until you have a little baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you feel and you're like, like analyzing the poop, heightened. and you're posting pictures of poop on social media. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know. And it's so it's it's so intense. And so I really wanted to make sure that you know I honored that quote unquote fourth trimester and provided tools for for navigating that in a it's calmer it's, manner. It's also a hormonal ride as well. It's not like birth, you know, birth is done and then you stop being pregnant. You should. Right. It takes a oh. while for your body to like figure out what the heck just happened. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it's intense. So, um what then what what do you say about the four the four trimester? Like what are some of the things you could do in the first trimester to be feng shui? Yeah. Um the biggest thing I feel is setting up your support system. And that looks different for each woman, of course. Some women don't live near family and you need to seek support from friends, from, you know, I uh, live in a town called Ojai, California, and we have this amazing nonprofit organization called Secure Beginnings. And I'm a, a volunteer for them and they send volunteers into a woman's home for the first three months of the baby's life. And we do the dishes and do laundry and hold the baby so the mom can shower. You know, so there are amazing organizations like that that provide that that support to women that again don't have like their mother next door, for example. Um, so really setting up that that base of support because a lot of times we think, oh, I'll do that when the baby's born. But as we just mentioned with the fourth trimester, it's an intense time, and sometimes it can feel like just too much to to reach out and ask for help. So setting mm-hmm. that up beforehand. I think is a big thing. And then also remembering that, of course, we can prepare by, you know, following those classic checklists and getting all the baby stuff and preparing in that way. But to realize that we don't know who our baby's going to be and we Mm -hmm. don't know who we're going to be as mothers. So just realizing that whatever we expect, it'll probably be different, not necessarily in a bad way, but just preparing to cut yourself a lot of slack, knowing that every decision you make probably won't be quote unquote perfect because there are no perfect decisions and and realizing that it is going to be a journey of trial and error as you get to know your baby. And then remembering that you will get through it, even Mm -hmm. though it's, it's intense, you know, you will move past it and you will get into your groove, but, um, yeah, releasing as many expectations as possible, setting up yeah. that support. And are there th- certain things that um, you can do? I, I'm still come coming back to the uh, feng shui, the actual use of the feng shui word. 
Like, are there things you can do in your space in that first trimester to um, make things more gentle on yourself? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm really big on decluttering, you know, just getting rid of all the unessential stuff, anything the like Marie Kondo, anything that doesn't bring you pleasure, you know, let it go. I'm big on that because when your external space is cluttered and you have a lot going on, that usually means that your internal space is also flustered and we already have to deal with enough of that having a new baby. So really simplifying your space. I'm also big on on setting up little zones. So kind of figuring out, okay, where do I anticipate I'll be spending the most time with baby, you know, setting up some changing zones, um, diaper changing zones, figuring out where you're going to want them to play, where you're going to want to breastfeed, setting up that space. So it's really nurturing for you having your bag of like snacks. So really having some forethought about, and of course, obviously things will change, like I said, with the expectations, but as much as possible, kind of setting up those zones and knowing that of course you're going to need to adapt Yeah. as you, as we never, we had four kids. We never had a changing table. We always kept diapers in a basket on top of the TV. It just worked. There you go. And that's such a perfect example. You know, what works for one family won't for another. And, you know, you just we bought all these to... cute over the car, over the backseat organizers. And yeah. man, oh man, I'm actually decluttering right now and still finding them like oh, 10 years later. Great. They never work because the baby just pulled the stuff out and drop it on the floor anyways. Right. But I, I thought all these things. So I guess my advice with the feng shui to tell my, my past self would be mm-hmm. um, to chill out a little bit, be, yeah. be flexible, be willing to move. Like, right. I remember the first drawer of my nightstand that was usually, you know, chapstick, hair things, scriptures, but it got soon cleared out and the, the breast pump stayed there because I didn't like the clutter on the nightstand. So I wanted it mm-hmm. in the drawer and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Just, yeah. And exa- exactly. And realizing that you don't have to like store those types of items in the traditional places. Like some people think, okay, like with the breast pump, like I had a lot of clients that thought it needs to be in the kitchen. I'm like, well, where do you actually use it? And a lot of them said, well, the bedroom. It's like, great, let's move it into the bedroom. So, you know, making life as simple as possible. And so, you know, going off of what you're saying, a great thing that women could do is declutter, you know, simplify your spaces only by the absolute essentials. And then when you have the baby and you kind of discover what your groove is, Mm -hmm. then you can create those zones. So that's another idea. Yeah, and not be like so... Pinned down. I just, I just come to mind this TikTok video I saw the other day about this guy exposing his wife's stash in the bedroom, her nursing stash. Oh <laughs> Opens the drawers and there's like tons of candy bars and snacks. She's like, oh, "Well, um, excuse me, I'm tied to this bed for half the day." Yeah, right. You would need a, a drawer of candy too if you were <laughs> burning 500 calories. Per yeah, season. exactly. Oh, but so I love funny. it. But it was all organized. Her her home looked like a model home, but you open these drawers and it's like. Oh. Oh, <laughs> That's so great. love it. We all we all have those drawers, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And and also just like what do you do about making I mean you've if you've never had a baby before, how do you know really what you're gonna need? Like are you gonna need a changing station? Are you gonna need a crib? Or do you would you rather have a bassinet? Or my mm-hmm. we didn't actually have a crib till um my second was I don't know, three or four months old when he needed to go into the pack and play that my first had been using. We didn't even own a crib. We just used mm-hmm. a pack and play for the entire first, our first baby yeah. didn't bless him, did not figure out how to crawl out of the pack and play. <laughs> <laughs> he was like 18 months old. I don't know what happened, but so yeah. it worked out, but I, like, I'm so yeah. glad we didn't like go out and buy a crib and then just not right. use it for two years, four years. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how do you make those, you know, what what questions do you ask or how do you decide what you're going to need in your space? And like making, making your partner move all their stuff out of the way so you can accommodate this new little human and all the gear. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I mean, especially when it's your first baby, you just don't know because again, you know, you don't know what your, you know, routine will be as a mother. Um, you know, of course, if you want to, if you know, you're going to want to breastfeed, you know, getting that breast pump, obviously diapers, wipes, the baby will need some clothes, you know, so there are items that you can be pretty sure that, that you're going to need, but yeah, you know, with the crib, that's a great point. It's like, we just, you know, you don't know what kind of bedding situation you're going to want to have and wait. (laughs) And knowing that, I mean, especially in this day and age, it's pretty easy to get 
pretty much anything we need within a couple of days. So yeah, it's so true. That's so true. Some of us yeah. live in the old school where you know you have to hoard, but you really don't. No, Amazon you don't. is happy to bring you anything you want. <laughs> exactly. I know. Forty eight so, hours. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so um, the word feng shui also brings up the word to me as the way you're talking about applying it, um, almost a ritual. So what are some of the rituals you can do in your second trimester to bring this feng shui feeling? Like, yeah, well, so I'll give kind of two different examples. One is kind of more practical. Um, it kind of goes back a little bit to the decluttering, but in feng shui, an idea is that you want to envision that water is flowing into your space and you envision this and then you notice if there's any area where that water would would stagnate and you try to kind of clear the energy in that space by putting Oh a, a my plant goodness. There. How Isn't old was I when I learned that definition of feng shui? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thank but you. it's that, Okay. It's, it's like when they put the, the purple stuff on your teeth to show where you haven't been brushing. Exactly. Okay. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, and so that really served me, at least when I was working as a um, home organizer, and I would kind of watch that. And and it would be, you know, like some spaces you go into, you're like, hey, like something feels off, but I just like can't quite figure out what it is. And when I would use that principle of the water, it would help me pinpoint, okay, this area yeah. is just like clogging up the space. And so clearing that, and that can help again, your physical space feel more harmonized, more at peace. And then once you have spaces that feel like that, that you want to be in, then this this next idea is easier. Um, and it's a very new idea that nobody talks about meditation. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. <but> careful <laughs> with that <laughs> for me. And I mean, I think I would do like five minute meditations. I'm not somebody that has this like two hour a day practice, which is wonderful if people can do that. Um, but the second trimester was really the time where I felt like I wanted to try to connect more with my baby. Um, you know, the first trimester I was kind of reconciling with being pregnant, finding the medical care provider, kind of checking off the more traditional to do's. And by the second trimester, I felt more settled, felt more prepared, and I was ready to get more into the the spiritual side of it and look at the big picture of what's happening. And so giving myself like five, 10 minutes a day, and I would just sit there with my hands on my belly, just connecting with the baby and just thinking about how do I feel about this? And let me say, not every meditation was like just wonderful and rosy. Sometimes I would realize like, oh, wow, I have, you know, certain fears that are coming mm -hmm. up and I, there's all sorts of stuff that I need to deal with. So it's not just this really beautiful, positive experience all the time, but it's, it was always pretty powerful for me and allowed me to really get to know myself as I went through those transitions and to figure out, you know, changes I wanted to make in my life, uh, fears that I needed to release. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't have to be meditation, you know, journaling, just like sitting outside for a couple minutes and letting your mind wander, but j just taking that time to really look at the bigger picture yeah, really, you know, supported me. And that's, you know, how I guide a lot of the, the women that, that take my classes through moving past, you know, different blocks when it comes to, to fear, anxiety, uh, different concerns about how their life is going to change. Well, and the second trimester is a great time to do that because the first trimester, you're usually busy worshiping the porcelain throne. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the, exactly. the second trimester, you have your energy back. So it's a great time to do the feng shui in your house and the feng right. shui in your, in your body. Yeah. So what is the, what is the, um, impact on us if we don't live so back to the physical realm and then yeah. we'll go to the <laughs> yeah. what is what's the impact on us if we don't live in a feng shui space feng shui space How yeah does that manifest in our life yeah i mean a lot of times it can trigger anxiety at different levels. Sometimes it's like just this underlying anxiety. We don't know why we don't feel comfortable in our home, but we don't feel, you know, energized. That's another thing. Our literal energy level is shifted when we have that chaotic kind of stagnant home. We just feel exhausted being in our space because a lot of times there's all of these like visual to do's like, Oh, there's that yeah. bookshelf. It's just a mess that I know I need to get to, it, but I just can't. And it just clutters 
our mind. It dampens our energy. Uh, for me, my my mood is really shifted, and I think I'm exceptionally sensitive to it. Um, mm. You know, everybody has different sensitivities, but again, I think everybody's affected no matter what. Um, but I get more irritable when my space is cluttered. It's messy. I I just feel tense. Um, so. Yeah. And again, it's like, you can get used to it. You're like, yeah, you know, this is always how my home is. It's, I mean, I even know some (laughs) friends that kind of like a slightly cluttered home, but then a lot of times, even with those people, when they finally clear it out, declutter and create the space that they feel comfortable in, they're more creative. I mean, a lot of this is creative people that feel like I need the mess, but a lot of times when they create less of a mess, like, oh, I actually have more space in my mind to be creative. So I think, and again, for me, I need things like really organized and no clutter. I'm pretty extreme with it. Not everybody needs a space like that. Again, we all say, If you're watching this video, you can see her space is amazing. (laughs) If you have it, just check out (laughs) that. Well, this is my like special corner. I'm in the one room of my house. Like this is mine. Nobody my corner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should see my son's room. Um, well, I know when I was a kid, I couldn't write a paper. I couldn't write a term paper if my room was a mess. And my mom exactly. was like, you're just procrastinating. I'm like, no, I just like cannot the creative flow. And exactly. you're thinking with pregnancy, you're making room for this whole new person and all their stuff. So if, you're, if your area is cluttered, that's going to be hard to yeah. like, bring yeah, more absolutely. in. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So I think people are always amazed when they they clear out that clutter they you know even just shifting some furniture around moving some paintings it can be very simple you don't need to go out and buy new furniture all of these like products from from the container store you know it can be a very very simple process but but really life changing yeah what i've seen yeah okay so you're a certified hypnotherapist so what does hypnosis have to do with pregnancy yeah so with a uh, hypnobirthing, we like to say that the body is like a robot that is controlled by the mind. So with, you know, pregnancy and childbirth specifically, when we have these negative, fearful, anxious thoughts and beliefs about that journey that often results in our body feeling more anxiety during birth, it often results in our body not wanting to, to open, to dilate, to relax. It's harder to breathe. So what we do with, with hypnotherapy and during the pregnancy journey is essentially reprogramming our beliefs about birth. Because as I said earlier, so much of our programming is based on media, on fearful birth stories. We might've been passed from, you know, well-meaning friends and family. And so, and it's not necessarily like a type of therapy where we're like dredging up all memories and talking about all these like intense fears, but saying, okay, well, what do we want to think about birth? You know, what are the positive alternatives to those fears and those worries? And that's what we focus on. Um, I do a lot of guided imagery, having women envision moving through this really gentle, beautiful birth experience. Uh, we do that a lot. You know, the, the hypnotherapy component is much more powerful when you do it on a regular basis. So a lot of the women that I work with, they're listening to these, you know, meditation recordings every single night. And by the time they, they reach the birth journey, their, their mind actually believes that, wow, this can actually be a a positive, empowering, gentle experience. And so often again, their body responds by having a more positive experience, which Mm -hmm. then supports those positive beliefs, you know, so it's this positive cycle that, that we're creating. Um, And, you know, and of course, as we all know, just doing a lot of hypnotherapy doesn't mean that you'll have this like orgasmic birth and nothing will go awry. But, but the cool thing is, as a doula, I've seen that the women that are really committed to, you know, reprogramming those negative beliefs, even when something goes different from how they expected, they feel more calm about it and they feel more empowered to make choices that they feel good about. You know, I've had women that were really set on having an unmedicated birth at home. They ended up in the hospital with an epidural, but still had a beautiful experience because they felt like, I felt like I was still in control and empowered during that experience. I made those choices. Um, so Again, it's not even outcome oriented, but more about how you feel through the journey and hypnotherapy really supports that. 
Very cool. And um, so hypnosis is, so you're saying it's basically, well, what do they mean by putting yourself into hypnosis then during childbirth? Yeah. Yeah. So hypnosis, it kind of sounds like this like elusive state, but it's a really normal state to be in. Um, when you're waking up in the morning and you're not like fully awake, but you're not completely asleep. That's a state of hypnosis. Same thing when you're falling asleep at night, when you're driving home and you end up in your driveway, but you don't remember the last 10 minutes you were in a state of hypnosis. So your conscious mind kind of floats away and your subconscious mind starts to pay attention. So during childbirth, for example, you know, what we typically do with hypnotherapy is we start with a progressive relaxation. You focus on your breathing, on, you know, relaxing the muscles in your body, just feeling as good and as calm as possible. And the idea is that this process helps to open up this filter that we have between our conscious mind and our subconscious mind. And the conscious mind just makes up about 12% of the mind. And that's where, you know, our to-do list and all of the thoughts that we're aware of live. And then the subconscious mind is about 88% of our mind. And that's where a lot of our inbuilt beliefs and behaviors live. You know, the subconscious mind is really what influences us as we, as we move through life. So when we remove that filter between the conscious and subconscious mind, we're able to implant these really positive life-changing messages into the subconscious mind. And so for example, with birth, you know, we, we open up that filter and we drop down beliefs like my body is soft and pliable. It opens. I release fears. I am healthy. I am strong. My baby is healthy. You know, we just drop down as many positive, empowering messages as possible to help to to get the body out of that state of of tension and and fear um and yeah and i've again i never thought that i would be somebody that would actually be a hypnotherapist and i mean if you asked me as a teenager i'd be like oh that doesn't work. yeah That's silly whatever yeah. <laughs> but i mean again after i experienced it during childbirth and i'm somebody that does not have a high pain tolerance like i was always like Just give me the medication um but i i was so amazed again during birth when you know, going through one of the most intense experiences women can go through. Um, I wouldn't say that I had absolutely no pain, but it, it wasn't scary. It mm -hmm. didn't feel unmanageable. Um, and it felt like it was making me stronger. Like, oh, wow. Like mm. this experience is really showing me what I've, what I'm made of in a really beautiful, powerful way. Um, and, and every single thing since all the challenges, I kind of go back. It's like, well, if I got through childbirth, like I can do this. And so it just totally changed my self-confidence. And, and I've seen that happen for so many. Yeah. Times. So hypnosis isn't just about relieving the pain. It's about connecting your body to the experience that's happening. So that makes you feel more powerful, more in control. <laughs> Control's elusive, yeah, but yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So it's not like we're trying to float away from the body. And sometimes a woman has that kind of experience, but that's not necessarily the goal right. of like disconnecting and feeling nothing, but about shifting how we perceive what we're feeling in the body. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about this before, but um, how do you um, how do you feel like the media stigmatizing birth affects how women give birth? Like, how what do you think the lasting impacts of that stigmatization? Stigmatization that word <laughs> yeah. of the media stigmatizing birth how do you how do you think that affects how yeah I mean birth? I think it has a profound impact on on how we view birth um because again I mean even if it's a, a movie or a tv show that's supposed to be funny almost all the time it is that that vision of the woman like screaming at her partner mm -hmm. and she's sweating and she's red in the face and everybody's running around like worried. And, and then when it's a dramatic scene, a lot of the time she's put into this life-threatening situation. And I mean, it is the, the extremes often of, of childbirth that we see in the media. And, and something that's interesting is a lot of times when we are watching 
TV, we are put into a state of hypnosis. You know, we, you know, that's why you, you laugh when something funny happens on TV or cry when something sad happens in a movie. You're oh in a state of hypnosis. Oh my gosh. So right? they're like imprinting on us while we're hypnotized. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, you're so vulnerable to that. Isn't my. that crazy? gosh, no wonder it makes such an impact because we're in a state of hypnosis and you're making the suggestions that birth is awful, painful, theatrical. Yeah. So that's what we're working with, with hypnotherapy is like all of these like traumatizing visions. You know, it's not just stories, but like you have seen, even though you know they're actors, like (laughs) it feels real. You're breaking breaking my head. Like (laughs) you must have me under some sort of spell. (laughs) Oh, that was my plan. Oh, oh my gosh. No, yeah. that's totally, that's, ex- okay. So wow. That's my new mantra. Yep. That's exactly, that's exactly what it is. That's why it's so powerful. Yeah. And so to reverse that, we could do so much good. Oh, oh, I love this. Oh, I love this. Okay. Ready? <laughs> I'm, re- I'm getting out my soapbox. I am a birth it. filmmaker. And so yeah. I would, I would just notice how women would watch these empowered births and then they would birth similarly, or they would like incredible things would happen at their births because they'd, they'd seen these good birth films, not the bad birth films, right. the good birth films. And, uh, but that makes total sense because if you're in a state of hypnosis and you're watching these really incredible films, your subconscious is processing that and that becomes your reality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, exactly. And so it's oh. so makes such a huge difference with, with people like you that are making films that again, depict birth really in a more accurate way. I was going to say real birth is pretty, it's, it's most of it's pretty boring. <laughs> it is. I know. And the, the hypnobirthing it's, Institute talks yeah. about that. They try to, they tried to get some of their videos on like some reality show about birth and the producer's like, no, they're too boring. Nothing happens. It's like, <laughs> there you go. That's why you yeah. don't see a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah. Births. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. Well, this just blew my tr- whole train yeah. of thought. Just, oh. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So what about um, being feng shui while you have little kids running around? Yeah, <laughs> feng shui physically so. and in your, in your body. Yeah. That's where it gets tricky. Um, no, you know, it's, it's still very possible. Um, <laughs> something that I have personally learned is, you know, definitely having to, to shift expectations yet again. Cause I mean, of course, when, I was single. I mean, even it was just my husband and I, I had more control over my space and, you know, I would create a peaceful space and it would stay like that. And anybody with children will know (laughs) you create that space. And then 10 minutes later, there's toys everywhere. And exactly. All your hard work goes out of the window. Um, and I feel, I sound like a broken record always coming back to this, but the most simple way to at least maintain, I'll start with the, like in the physical realm first is, is simply having less stuff. Probably once a month, I, I secretly go through my son's stuff and just like get rid of all the stuff he doesn't use and just like all of the extra CRAP. Um, and with myself and my husband too, you know, it's just like this, I don't want to call it a constant battle, but this constant journey of releasing. Oh, just stuff. call it how it is. It's a battle. Oh my well, God. I'm it's like, a tr- <laughs> You know, the al- sometimes. <laughs> it's like alchemy. Like how can a, a, a wire hanger turn into a sock or vice versa? Like how can I, it's just like stuff multiplies. It does. It does. And, and so again, I think every family, you know, has their own like time frame with it. Again, for me, like I really need to do it like once every month, every two months and just spend a day kind of going through and decluttering some families don't need to do it that often. Um, but I think that's the number one thing. And then of course, and this is more personal for each family, you know, figuring out a plan, at least when your kids are older of like, okay, you know, before leaving one space to go to another, we're going to clean up. And, you know, and I've kind of found my own rhythms with, you know, how I, how I support that. Um, but again, at the most basic level, just having less stuff means that there's less, less to clean up. Um, and then, in regards I just, to, yeah, go I just ahead. want to insert the less stuff thing because sometimes it's like, well, I need all this stuff. So one thing, this is earth shattering, guys. Ready for me to like blow, blow your brains? Okay. So my kids, we had three kids. I threw all of their socks away. Every single last stupid little pair of Carter socks <laughs> threw away. Uh-huh. Went to Walmart and I got big, huge. But I mean, it would work for Carter's too if that's your thing. But I bought huge, big bulk. Like I bought like a hundred pairs of socks 
in, awesome. in all four sizes for our kids. I guess that was fourth. We had our fourth by then. Mm-hmm. And um, they were all different. And I planned it so that the oldest would then pass down his. And then he would pass down, his, you know, to the next one. Guys, when, they, when you only have four types of socks in your entire house, and they're all the same. And I bought like a load because I didn't want Walmart to change their pack, you know, change their right. socks and then we uh-huh. have to start over. Right. We did that. We did that about eight years ago and it's totally changed our life because oh gosh, we still have the same genius. number of t- socks in our lives. But right. if you find the, like this little orphan sock, you just put it back in the basket because it's going to get used instead of like trying to find the match. Oh my gosh. Now, now you're blowing my mind. Yeah. My baby <laughs> is nine and I'm still finding newborn socks sometimes oh when I go gosh. through boxes or whatever, you know, right. mismatched newborn socks. And I'm like, come on. Oh How many gosh. socks does a newborn need? Anyway. That's so funny. Yeah. That's such so a there you idea. go. Yeah. So thinking of stuff like that, you know, great, getting creative with your family's needs. If you're like, oh my God, I hate the mismatched socks. I can never find them. Then kind of stepping back and thinking, all right, like, how can I simplify this instead of like beating my head against the wall about this problem? Because usually there is a pretty like simple solution. So yeah, I think that that's- Get rid of all the four piece outfits. Ain't nobody exactly. got time for that. Heck Yeah. <laughs> I know my my son used to have this like beautiful long hair and it was such a pain in the butt and Claire. we cut it all off and life is better for everybody. <laughs> yeah. you know, my, my little girls wore bobs for the same reason. They would wake up with a rat's nest as big as their head, head and our, our kids have really fine hair. So I just cut it all off. Just made no, it easier. No, it's <laughs> great. super cute. Well, and so often I think like we have this idea of like, oh, like motherhood's supposed to be hard and we need to struggle. And like, but it's like, I think it's totally fine as much as possible to simplify things as much as you can, like make life easier for yourself. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and like, it's temporary. Possible. Like I, yeah, I'm a, I don't, I'm a minimalist. I don't like a lot of clutter, but we had fabric chairs. I bought some cheap like wedding chair cover things. And we lived with those like tattered chair covers for two years until we got out of the smearing oatmeal phase. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then they're gone. And, and it just, I, my chairs, like that to me made it yeah. sim- more simple because I could just take the chair covers off and then put them back on when they're clean. Absolutely. Just, yeah. no, but to that's other people idea. that may find it was, it would be crazy to do the, the clutter, the, the clutter of the chair cover, but I hated washing. I hated digging, <laughs> yeah. digging oatmeal out of my upholstery. For real. Yeah. No. And so exactly like little hacks, I guess is the word for it. I'm, I'm all about that. Yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. So, um, what do you want women to take away? What most do you want women to take away from your book? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I want them to go away with an awareness that they they do not need to birth my way or their doctor's way or their mother's way, but to feel empowered to really almost craft their own birthing philosophy. To say like, to pull out little pieces from my book, from a class they took, from another book, from a birth documentary, and and to again, really create their own thing that, that guides them through their journey. And that ultimately nobody knows better than you what feels right during this journey. Like you are the expert on your body. You will be the expert on your baby and that you can trust yourself. What a concept. What a concept. (laughs) Wow. Okay. So how do people find more about you? Yeah. So the best way is my website, baileygaddis.com. And that has the links to all my social media. I am, I am really, I'm active on a lot, but I'm, it has a link to my YouTube channel and I post two videos a week on everything related to pregnancy, birth, early motherhood. And, uh, yeah, so that's the best way, my website. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, and you can also, yeah, on Amazon, we've, we've got some copies here at birth circle that, that are making the rounds among the teams. So very, very cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. This was such a pleasure, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Please visit us at birthcircle.com, join our Facebook groups, or find us on Instagram and Pinterest. 
We hope you'll use our resources to support your birthing experience.